Hello everyone, I'm Ed Fuller, the editor of the Trackside Photographer, and I want to welcome you to the first episode of Talking Pictures. Today we will be talking pictures with Oren Helbach and Ross Fluckenhauer. Oren is a photographer and uh, Ross is a engineer, fireman, and railroader. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Uh, it seems to me that the, that, the, that the pictures that we're going to be looking at in a few minutes have, are really a collaborative effort between the two of you. And Ross, maybe you could tell us a little bit to start uh, about, about yourself and about the work that you were doing at the time we, uh, at the time Oren took the uh, photographs that we're going to be looking at. Of course. So um, I had the privilege of, of growing up uh, pretty much within uh, earshot of the Strasburg Railroad whistle most of my life. Um, and two days out of high school, um, I started there as an employee and worked there for a number of years full time. And during that course of employment, um, had yeah some varied roles within the shop. Um, and then also worked to becoming um, engineer, fireman, conductor um, as well. Um, I'm currently a part-time employee and maintain my qualifications on the operation side. Um, so the pictures that we'll be looking at this evening um, would have been taken for me, what would have been at that time, just another day at work um, and are in tagged along and, and recorded what we'll look at shortly. Oren, I think you and I met for the first time a few years ago at a Center for Photography and Art, um, Railroad Photography and Art conference in Chicago. And uh, we've had the opportunity to get together a, a couple of times, once at the uh, East Broadtop. And I think the last time I saw you was in Chicago in 2019 at the, um, at the conference. And you presented at that conference. And, and I would recommend, that I'll put a link below to the uh, presentation uh, that is still available, is, is it not, Oren? Yeah, I'll put yes, a link to that. Yeah, I'll put a link to that uh, uh, presentation, a video of his presentation. I missed it because I had flight problems, and my flight didn't get in until the conference was halfway over. So I just, I think I just missed your presentation on Saturday that day. And then you and um, uh, George Hyotis and I went to the Illinois Railroad Museum on Sunday afternoon after the conference ended, and we had a nice, uh, we had a nice time up there. So, and that that afternoon at the Illinois Railroad Museum, you had a chance, Ed, to watch me doing what I did with Ross, photographing yes. railroaders at work. Yeah, when we got there, George and I took off for the for the locomotives and, and the trains, and Oren honed right in on the uh, on the people who were working at the railroad there. So the first time, and I'll put some pictures up uh, that I took of Oren. Um, you know, talking to the people there. And every time we, it seemed like every time we crossed paths, you were talking to, to somebody or taking pictures of somebody. And I, and I think one of the things that you do, Oren, that's very important and helpful is that when you, when you take someone's picture and talk to them, you also offer to send them, a, a, send them that picture. And I think people really appreciate that. I know, Ross, you had mentioned the other night that, that uh, one of the, that, that the first time you had met Oren, that he had sent you a picture. And, yeah, absolutely. And, I still have it. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's uh, I think that's an excellent thing for all of us to keep in mind because so many times we sort of just stand around, take pictures, and and we don't really interact with anybody. And Oren, you're real good at, at at connecting with people. So I give I give the credit for that to my father. Mm -hmm. Uh, I learned at his knee, and not only was he a master photographer, but he was also a people person. So when we traveled, or even in our own neighborhood in the Bronx, he was always talking to railroaders. Mm -hmm. And when we traveled, no matter where we showed up, he'd stick out his hand and say, I'm John Helbach from New York City. You got a real interesting place here. Can we look around? And we got access because of his <laughs> outgoingness. And then he would send pictures graph. So my, my favorite story about this now is we went to see, we went to visit the arcade in Attica in New York state in 1972, the year I was seven. And my father got a really beautiful photograph of their two steam locomotives in front of their shop building 
when we went back in 1975, he gave them an 11 by 14 print, nicely sepia toned of this photograph. Instant access that year, we rode the engine and got to hang out with the crew. I didn't get back to Arcade for another 40, 42 years. I was back there again in 2017. I went with Ross and his family. In the station at Arcade, they have a spectacular collection of photographs, historical photographs of the railroad going all the way back to its beginnings. Lots of pictures of crewmen. And there on the wall is my father's 11 by 14. The one that he gave them in 1975 is on the wall in the Arcade station as part of this historical tableau. So my, that, that's a, a great example of my father's ability to really have an influence in a place. He shows up, he does great work, he shares it, and the people appreciate it and remember it. And I think the same can be said for you from what I've observed. Uh, I will hope that in 40 some odd years, there will be places like that, <laughs> yes. Well, I had the privilege of meeting your father uh, at, the, at that conference. So he, he was there for your presentation, that was nice. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's what the presentation was about. It was about you and your interaction with your father and how your own interest in railroading and photography grew out of that. It, it, was, it was effectively a love letter to my father, yes. Yes, that's, it was very nice. All right. Well, shall we look at some pictures? Sure. All right. Okay, so uh, so y'all tell me what tell me what we're looking at here. This is a well, great father son let, let, portrait, as I take it. Let me let me step back. Okay. Just a, just a bit. Ross and I had met years ago on some occasion that I have to confess I have no memory of whatsoever. Uh, uh, Seven sixty five at Steamtown. Okay. That, and that was I, uh, Labor Day. Um, I take your word for it. So yeah, it yeah. would have been Labor Day of 2015. Correct. Yep. Okay. So we met, we conversed, it, it passed <laughs> me by. But in November of 2015, I went out to the Everett Railroad in Western Pennsylvania, in it's Blair County, same county as Altoona. The Everett had just started running their little steam locomotive the number 11, a really beautiful little 260. I went out to see this locomotive and it happened to be a day that Ross was also there with his son, Kenny, his oldest son. And there were a few other people in, in train world who had converged this day. So- Pretty much um, everybody in the train world had converged that day. But just yeah. to interject, the 11 is more than just a cute little 260. It's one of the few steam engines that could be considered tourist railroad royalty in that it ran at rail city in starting what year um uh late i have, I have to look for sure but arguably may have it rail city is in the running for being one of the first tourist railroads in north america um so that was just just that aspect of that engine's history, it was just amazing to see that engine living again. Right, this, this engine that, that had, it had, it had run at Rail City very briefly because it was actually too heavy for the track or too, or too big for the curves. So it didn't run much and then bounced around various places in the Northeast for decades until Alan Maples at the Everett resurrected her. We met Alan that day the president owner of the Everett Railroad. Howard Pincus was there, someone else who's been around tourist railroading roughly forever. Uh, Mike Hewn, a, a young fan. And um, in the course of the day, somehow Alan decided that we were worth inviting to dinner and then to his office at the railroad at Duncansville where he keeps the photo archive from the steam directory, the books that were published for decades originally by the Empire State Railroad Museum, Alan had at some point acquired their photo archive, which is housed in two printer paper boxes. So that evening after supper, the group of us, there were six or eight of us, sat around the conference table in Alan's office and just pulled these photographs out of these boxes, the way I've always described it, we were up to our elbows in tourist railroad history. 
I had read the Steam directories. My father had the first one that he bought was I think the first one that came out in 1967. And we had the, the full set. Every year we would get a new one. My father photographed for the directory. It was one of the ways we got access. We'd show up at a place like the arcade in Attica. And my father would say, I'm photographing for the Steam directory. Well, all of his prints were there. And the prints that John Krause had sent in and Michael Eagleson had sent in and Jim Rin had sent in and even O. Winston Link, there was a five by seven of double-headed A's on Blue Ridge that somehow was just in this box. We sat there for two or three hours with not necessarily the history of our lives, but certainly the, a good portion of the passion in our lives laid out on this table in front of us. It was utterly magical. So that was the, the, first, the first hours that Ross and I spent together were amidst this shared history. We have subsequently spent time elsewhere at the Everett and elsewhere photographing trains. The photograph here that we're looking at is Ross and Kenny on a later visit to the Everett as the train goes by, it makes sense to me to photograph them doing what they're loving. And, and Kenny is, Ross, Kenny is your son. And how old was he at that point? Uh, what year was this taken? This is uh, fall of 17. Um, so he would have been like seven. Okay. So and, what... Yeah, and was just, um, loved going chasing trains with me was just expressing an interest in taking his own pictures as well. Um, right. So yeah, it was, it was a great day. Yeah. So, and th so this is sort of the start of your relationship, the, the two of you, uh, the relationship between the two of you. Well, I would say by this time in 2017, it's deep in. <laughs> uh -huh. okay. But it's at least, the, it is the same location where we met at least. Oh, I got yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Same location, but it, it was, we, we very quickly realized, Ross and I realized that we, we have a really deep shared passion for railroading and tourist railroading and steam railroading. And uh, even though we come from very different places, where we met is a place that the two of us just completely click and align. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I would say so for myself, we mentioned about, you know, Oren sharing pictures. So certainly, you know, we had an enjoyable, enjoyable day at the Everett that first time. And, um, you know, the, the childhood glee of pawing through all the pictures was just, yeah, it was magnificent. Um, but then, yeah, a week or so later, I get this picture in the mail. I was like, wow, yeah, that's pretty neat. And then at the time, Oren did not have a website, um, but he had an email list uh, and he included me on that. And I started getting these photo essays of some of his, yeah, some of his travels. Um, and I remember fairly early there, a month or two after we met, he sent one of a day spent at Strasbourg, which we did not see each other that day. But I remember looking at those pictures and, and reading his words and realizing that this is a man who he sees the railroad as a railroader sees it. Like the pictures he's taking are the things that I'm looking out the cabin being, wow, that's really nice to see. Um, and that was just amazing, um, somewhat of a rarity. I mean, there's there's a number of people who take, um, well, as you shared, Ed, there's a lot of um, people who run to the equipment and take great pictures of trains. Um, but I was amazed to see Aaron took pictures of the people. <laughs> um, he also took pictures of, he took landscape pictures that, oh, by the way, happened to have a steam engine in them. Um, mm -hmm. And that really appealed to me. I was like really impressed by his eye and and the, um, yeah, the artistry of his craft. Right. right. And Ross, this is you, where, where was it, where is this? Uh, that would also be at the Everett. Um, on that specific day, uh, this is a later date than the first picture, if I remember correctly. Um, that would be during their Santa trains. Um, yep. And we had chased all day. Um, and then we invited ourselves. Well, we were invited to ride. Um, and we asked, could we please ride in the combine? We're like, well, if you want to. And we kicked the door open and... You know, the 11 pulled us up the hill as, as she was meant to do. Um, and it was, you know, that, that kind of 
gray of December where it's light one minute and somehow it gets to be dark the next. And it was just the end of a beautiful day. Um, uh, yeah, I remember we were coming, coming back to the station on that trip. Um, you could see there was a fairly fresh snow. Um, you could see tracks of wild turkeys track side. Oh. Um, me being me, I was highly amused that we could see rail fan tracks as well. Um, <laughs> and the turkeys were actually roosted in the woods um, just off near the horizon. And it was just like, is, is this actually real? Um, it was just marvelous. Yeah. So, so you weren't working that day. You were rail fanning that day. I was so, just rail fanning. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm doing in this picture is what I did all day. Just enjoyed oh. the experience. <laughs> all right. Um, be before we move on to, because we're going to be in black and white from here on out. And, and Orrin, I wanted to ask you, and I, I don't want to get into a lot of technical detail here. And I know you shoot digitally, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but a lot of your work comes in black and white. Um, and I wondered if, if any of this was shot on film. Do you, do you use film at all or for the black and white or? No, the last the last black and white film I shot was 1998. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't go digital until 2009. In the interval, I had children, huh. and just did not have time for serious right. photography. So I shot a thousand rolls of color of snapshots, just color print film. Yeah. But I had yeah. spent 25 years as a film photographer from when I was a kid until I had my own children. Okay. So when I came back to it and and started doing photography seriously. And then a, I, it was really only around the time that I met Ross that I really started doing it a lot and going out many, many days. I'm a much better photographer now than I was in 2015, simply by practice. I th oh. When I'm out in the field, I don't necessarily think in black and white, but when I have a picture in front of me on the computer and I'm, right. and I'm working on it, some work better in black and white, some work better in sure. color and everything that we see from here on out, they just, they work better in black and white. Yes. They're, they're, additionally, they're, there's all of the, the baggage that comes along with black and white. Oh, it must be old. I'm not trying to pretend that they're old, but if they have that timeless quality, I'm all over it. Yeah, I, when you were shooting film, did you shoot mostly black and white or did you shoot slides or combinations? Mostly black and white, I did um, about, a year or two years of color slides when I was traveling around the country after college and didn't have access to a dark room. So I did okay. slides simply so I could get them done. Yeah. But before and after that, it was all black and white. All well, film. It's interesting because I've, I've recently had a couple of discussions with folks about black and white versus color for railroad photography. And there's a, there's a, there's a contingent of people who really believe that black and white is the color of photography. And, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I, I work more in color than I do in black and white, but um, it, it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, at, at some point, I would very much like to put a book together of my work. I think that if that be... book had to be only black and white, I'd be disappointed. Okay. Because I've done some strong color work. Right. On, on the other, I mean, I, I might not be deathly disappointed, but um, I believe that Clearly, you just need to do two books. But let's, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would, that would be great. But it, it really, it depends a lot on, on the image. Sure. Some, some work better one way than another. This, this one of Ross, it's not, it's not a snapshot. I mean, that, that is a, a composed photograph and it's one that I care deeply about. It's just one of my best friends in the world sharing an experience with me. Mm -hmm. it works much better in color than it does in black and white. Yeah. Because you get a much better sense of that time of day being out there as the sun is going down in a color photograph. Right, well, that's an interesting viewpoint because I think a lot of uh, photographers in general feel like they either have to be a black and white photographer or they have to be a color photographer. And like you say, some things will just work better in one and, and not the other. So I think you just have to be, be flexible. What I, and I have to say, you know, from what I've seen of your black and white work, it's really very strong. And, and the reason I'm, I'm sort of uh, pushing on this film thing is that um, I myself have a lot of trouble getting 
um, satisfactory black and white results from digital. And you, this stuff looks like it was shot on film or and it really does. Well, at some point you and I will need to be in the same room and you can look over my shoulder as I process an image. Okay. Yeah, that would be it. I, I'm not sure how much I can talk about it, but I can certainly show you what I do. Right. So uh, Ross, this is you at work. I take it. It this is. is. This was a February morning, if memory serves me correctly. Um, yep. That would be in the cab of 89. Um, and yeah, Aaron came down and um, spent the morning with me hostling, which um, for those who are unaware, hostling is just a pit stop for a steam locomotive. It, it's getting it ready for the day. Mm -hmm. um, so 89 would have had a bank in it. Um, so there was some pressure on the boiler. Um, I don't remember it as a bad day, so there must have been adequate pressure. Um, so you break the bank, clean the grates, um, do all the lubrication, uh, boiler treatment, and hand it off to the crew to go play with. Um, so where the engine's sitting right there just happens to be directly beside one of the windows on the north side of the engine house. Um, so that's just natural light streaming in in a February morning. Well, I was going to comment on that because, <clears throat> you know, I, I assumed, Doran, that you <clears throat> weren't carrying studio lights around with you, but that's <laughs> no. a that's a that's an excellent the way the light is falling through that window is just a really excellent effect. And, and the other thing I, I like about this, as well as the other photographs, is um, the, the balance of detail and light and shadow. Um, you know, we're picking up just enough detail in here and you're not afraid to let things, you're not afraid to lose detail in the shadows. And I think that really creates a much stronger picture. It focuses the attention where you want it to be and but yet there's a, enough of a detail to set the scene and so that we know pretty much what we're looking at um and, and i think that works really well in this photograph as well as a number of the other ones that you have and of course the way the light comes through the window there is just classic portrait lighting and that's just that's just dumb luck because in in general i don't even remember that there's a flash attached to my camera even in situations where it might be useful <laughs> Right. So I'm I'm just an available light guy. If it's if if the light is right, I capture it. If it's not, I don't have any means of, of doing anything about it. Right. But but I, I would I would medium. dispute that it's dumb luck though, because I think it may not have been something you were consciously thinking about at the time you pressed the shutter, but I think as you take a lot of photographs and have a lot of experience and you look at a lot of photographs, um, I think that that kind of thing becomes intuitive to you. So, you know, you do things, you may not be thinking about it right at that moment, but they're intuitive reactions to the scene and, and they guide you into just what you need for that particular scene and for that particular feeling. No, I will, I will, that I will agree with. When I said dumb luck, what I meant was if the locomotive had been parked 20 feet in either direction. Oh, gotcha, yeah. Where the yeah. light was not coming in that window, this photograph would never have taken place. Right. So this one again, I don't I don't recall the circumstances, but um, Ross tells me that this is one that he told me to take. <laughs> is it, is well, yes, it was following the first one, and I just leaned out and said, "Hey, take my picture." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, here we're we're dealing with with absolutely gorgeous light that just happens to be in exactly the right place. It it really is, yeah, yeah. That's a great. I think that's a great photograph. Um, and again, and these these are these are relative rarities. It's it's extremely rare that I can say to somebody, "Hey, stand still and let me take your picture." You know, look right. at the camera and right. smile. I'm not comfortable doing that. In this case, again, I'm with one of my best friends, which makes it so much easier to capture that. Right. And, and I would say, from from my end, that would be, I would reciprocate that in that. Um, like I expressed, you know, for me, this is another day at work. Um, and there's some aspect where having someone shove a camera in your face and, you know, sure. take 800 pictures in the course of your morning's work. Um, you know, there's a certain vulnerability with that. Um, and so, yeah, getting to that level of trust where you can just be relaxed and be comfortable and, you know, just enjoy each other as friends. And, oh, by the way, 
I'm working and oh, by the way, Aaron's taking pictures. Um, and it, it, yeah, it's really a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to, um, to what I'd said earlier about this being a collaborative effort because mm -hmm. that level of friendship that you've developed over a period of time really comes through in these pictures. I mean, there's, there's an obvious element of affection going both ways here. And I think that, that really adds to the power of these photographs. And from here on out, the ones that we look at are Ross at work, but the access that I get and as close as I get, it's because of that, the strength of that friendship. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's not, it's not everyone that I get to do this with. Right. And here again, we see the very um, graphic black and white uh, composition here, which I love. And this, this photograph has been altered from the actual reality. There are fluorescent lights on the ceiling of that engine house. I painted them out. Yeah. Made them go away because it's a much stronger photograph when you have just that big black area behind the locomotive. Sure. Yeah. You, you have a, a lot of these photographs, the, it, it really goes to black. And that's not, that's not easy to do. It's hard to get the correct exposure you know, on, on your subject, on your nominal subject. And have you know the blacks go deep like that, but I think it I think it really adds to the photograph because you, it, you don't have any distracting elements. I mean, fluorescent lights right. up there would have been very distracting. I think in this yeah in this case. Now I'm assuming this is not a posed photograph. This is no no, 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 you, no you what I have in my hand, and then the other container that's sitting on the cut lever. Um, right. That's the water treatment for the day. So if you ever wondered about how much. <laughs> boiler treatment goes in um that's it it's not a huge amount um and that's what i'm doing i'm just climbing up to pour that into the cistern on the tender right and it's, yeah it's all the all the photographs from here on out they're just ross at work and me following around and keeping the camera aimed right <clears throat> and well, these uh, actually would have these pictures were taken before the two of me on 89 that we were just looking at okay Right. This is these are now August of 17. I spent I spent a morning as Ross was hostling both the 90 and the 475 on, a, on an August day. Was this very early in the morning? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, was it fully light daylight at that point or are we in a engine house or? No, this is this is the, the tender is is right at the doorway. So we're getting this is all sunlight that's coming in. OK. okay. Yeah, we uh, we would have started probably around seven o'clock in the morning, I believe. Yeah. About probably. And in, in August at that, at this latitude, that's light. Mm -hmm. Right. With, with respect to um, the way that I process photographs. Yes. I will, in a situation, I, I didn't do that in this case, but in some photographs, if in order to get the, the person and the background at the right comparative contrast, Mm -hmm. I'll cut out that person. I'll go all the way around and cut out that person and make a separate layer of that person uh -huh. so that I can adjust the, the blacks and whites completely separate in the subject and the background. Yeah, and I think that that's um, a really interesting thing because, um, you know, in my mind, I question how you can preserve the tonality in his shirt and, you know, his, his figure, but yet everything else falls almost completely to black and white. So, uh, you know, I think that works really well. Uh, I also like the composition of this, the, the light and the 90 and the two wheels down at the bottom, providing that sort of rhythm of bright spots in it. I think that's very effective as well. And it's otherwise, it's a very static photograph, except for Ross. Right. Everything else is just dead center, but here we have the motion coming in from the side. And carrying us in with it, yeah carrying our eyes into the photo. This is backing the engine out of the engine house. So from in this case, I'm standing on the ground looking up, which is usually how I see engineers standing on the ground looking up. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and again, the, I, I just love the way the background is completely black. You know, I, and I have almost certainly painted something out there, whether it was the reflection off a gauge or um, I don't know if the um, 
if the uh, vent hatch in the roof would have shown through, but I have I have enhanced that darkness for the sake of the photograph. Yeah, well, I think it's very effective. I think any any details showing behind him there would just detract from from the overall effect of the photo. And again, you just preserve it preserves you just preserve such great tonality in in his figure. You know, his skin and and his shirt and all just have such a a, a, a good range of tonality, and it just uh, works really well against that stark black. So this is now aboard the 475. Ross is raking the fire. I'm standing basically in, I'm standing on the engineer's seat looking down into the okay into the space between the yeah, cabinet. I was going to ask you where in the world you were when you took this picture. Yeah, this is, um, I'm in the, uh, the, the throttle is right over my right shoulder here. Okay. And so the what I'm accomplishing at this point um, is basically the, the, the bank, you break it up with a, a slash bar, which is essentially like a digging iron into football or fist five size chunks um, and push it to the front after you've cleaned it. In this picture, I'm actually bringing the fire back after I've cleaned the rear sets of grates. Okay. Th this is a hand fired locomotive. It is. That is correct. Okay. Is this was this taken in August as well? Mm -hmm. It's a hot yeah, job. Yeah, he, he didn't Photoshop all that sweat on me. <laughs> it was a hot job. Yeah. <laughs> this is another one that I really like. I, I really like the graphic nature of this. Um, tell us a little bit about this, Oren. So at Strasbourg, they fill the locomotive tenders with an old-fashioned water plug, which is really cool. There, there are very few places that have this. Most, most railroads will just drag a hose up to the top of the tender and run water in. Strasbourg, it feels like what we think of as a real railroad with the accoutrements. There's not a, there's not a coaling tower. We haven't, we haven't gotten to build one of those yet. But for putting water in the locomotive, it looks and feels old, authentic. From the ground, not all of the, the action is, you, you can't see all of it happening. The, the, you know, the water pouring into the tender is happening out of view from someone who's standing on the ground, at least close to the locomotive. But as Ross then swings the, the, the um, water spout away from the tank with that last bit of water dripping out, there's no question what has gone on. Yeah. So those drips are telling that story. Yes. And without those, it, it would be definitely a, still a strong graphic image, but there'd be much less story there. Right. Yeah. I think the drips really tell the story of what's going on. Uh, and, and it's a very great, it is a very graphic image, I think. I like it. And this one, it may, it may be atypical of the photographs that I've made of Ross but it's somewhat typical of the photographs that I've made of many railroaders. We don't see Ross's face here. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone who knows him will recognize him, but otherwise that is just a person. And it's important for people who look at my work to understand, I am not trying to depersonalize. It's not that, it's not that Ross is not an individual. But in, in an image like this, what Ross is doing, what he stands for is all of the thousands of people who have done this over the years. Mm -hmm. I'm doing something here that speaks to the, the larger world of railroading, that history. Who knows how many millions of times someone pushed a water spout away from a tank by having a person in it who was not necessarily immediately recognizable, it speaks to that. Right. And this is a, a, a somewhat common, common photographic subject at, at one point in, in the history of railroad photography. You look back at some of the earlier uh, people who were working w during the age of steam railroading, uh, you would see images similar to this quite often. Uh, and there's just something about it, I think, that, as you say, just ties together the whole idea of what's of what steam railroading was all about and uh, 
and the water, the, the, the last of the water coming out there, as you said, really, really tells the story. I think it goes Lauren, to, go ahead. It, it goes to how we think of these, these machines as living beings. And here we're, we're watching one being uh -huh. watered, if not fed. Right. That I think there really is something about the life of the machine in watching that water being put into the tank. Right. And, and that life is so out in the open with a steam locomotive. Absolutely. So a question, Aaron. Um, so a couple of times you've made mention of like removing, editing out the fluorescent lights or editing it out, editing out a gauge reflection. Um, do you only edit out or do you, you ever add in? So like, are these drops of water like from a waterfall somewhere and you put them in here? <laughs> <laughs> the, the short answer is almost never. Um, and I so would you say- you remove, but do not add. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only case, sometimes within a photograph, I will move something a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, I have on at least one occasion where I had a photograph of a locomotive coming out of of a tunnel that was backlit and the plume of, of steam, it was mo much more steam than smoke, um, was just all blown out. I did take a bunch of smoke from somewhere else and paste it in there. <laughs> sure, but, but that's, that's the exception to the rule. It's definitely an exception. It's just, it's not the way, it's, it's not the way that I've, I've gotten used to thinking about it. And I would say there were probably times when I would have done better to think about it, but I just don't. Sure. It's not, it's not, again, just not part of the language that I'm used to speaking. But those, those drops are real. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's going on here, um, Ross? So now this is on 89 again um, in, I assume this is in December. Um, it's by the engine house. Um, almost ready to hand off to the crew. Um, and I'm adding sand to the sand dome. Um, so the, the dome to the right of the rear of the picture is the steam dome. And the one that I'm adding to is the sand dome. So topping that off for the crew before I hand off the engine. Yeah, I think this photo shows a little more context too. You, the water tower down there in the distance and the tracks leading out of it. Um, I think that's very effective as well. Do you have the means to uh, to enlarge this, Ed? The the reason I ask is that it's not it's not necessarily visible at this scale, but if if you look at it up close or see it larger, there's actually a small leak in that bucket that Ross is using. Uh huh. And under his hand, at the bottom edge of that bucket, there's this little trail of sand coming out. So that that's actually remember. the handle on the on the on the sandbox, just at the very edge of the of the bucket. There's there's this little bit of sand coming out, which I feel quite confident I did not notice at the time or when I processed this photograph or at any time until I handed one to Ross. And then Ross said, oh, look at that. There's a leak in the bucket. That's part of the reason that <laughs> photographing Ross is such a joy is that he sees everything in this photograph from, from the, the, the um, the largest scale graphic qualities to those tiny details that all combine to tell the story. I may capture these things completely by mistake, but Ross sees them right. and points them out to me. And it's a better photograph after he's looked at it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know, it's it, to, ca to catch the moment, you, you don't have a lot of time to really examine everything closely and, and take in all of the, you know, when you're behind the camera, it's really difficult to take in all the small details and everything and the amount of time you'd have to capture the image at the point you want to capture it, so. Well, and sure some people the are better reason at that. that and... the... Go on, Ross. The other reason that the leak in the bucket would stand out to me, because as the hostler, then I had to spend more time wiping all the sand off of the <laughs> running gear to make sure that it did not do any damage. Right. Um, so there, that's more just seeing it as a, as a worker um, as opposed to seeing it as an art form, as a photographer. Right. 
Okay, and here's uh, Ross in, in the cab. Um, and again, we have the strong black and white elements. And one of the things that I, that I really like about this photo are the, the various shapes of almost white in it, um, starting up in the upper left-hand corner. You, you know, you've got one, two, three, four, five, at least six or seven shapes of white that I think really add to the sense of movement uh, for this. I think if that was all just black in front of uh, Ross there that we wouldn't have as much of a sense that that we're that we're moving. And then the the way Ross is just wonderfully framed again by the uh, camp window there. Mm -hmm. And th this is one of the few occasions when I'm seeing instead of standing on the ground looking up at the cab where I have the opportunity to be in the cab looking out and that the engineer is central to both of those views, but you get a completely different sense of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And again, one, one of the things I like about the picture is, so the context of this picture is I'm just running the light engine up the hill to clean it out. Um, we're still in yard limits, weren't going that fast. Um, but in the picture, you can't tell that. Um, and in some respects, that is, you know, America, Strasburg Railroad is known as America's shortest or oldest short line. I sometimes joke that it may be America's shortest short line. Um, but within those confines of four and a half miles, you get to have experiences like this where, no, it's, it's not going 80 miles an hour for 12 hours. Um, but you get to have those tastes of what it must have been like. Um, and this picture captures what it was like. And what it is like every time we get an engine ready um, and we haven't even left yard limits yet. Yeah, that's, right. that's where I'm not, I'm not pretending that this was made on the plains of Colorado on the Great Western Railroad in 1938, but if it has the feeling of that, I think I've captured something. Well, I think, yeah, I think you have captured something definitely. And, uh, and again, um, it, just the right level of detail. You know, I think, again, this is the kind of picture where too much detail would just, just detract from the overall effect of it. And, and you're catching just, just the right amount there, the, the seat cushion, you can see a little bit of detail down Ross's um, uh, pants leg there. Um, I just think that works really well. If I went back and redid it now, there's some chance that I would actually paint out the uh, reflection in the back the, uh, the seat back on the, the very right hand back. edge there in the the uh nolga hide on the seat back i think that's a little distracting yeah, yeah maybe it doesn't doesn't really bother me I, it's not something that that stood out to me as but i can see what you're saying i, I don't think the photo would be hurt in any way by having that gone well while we're talking about irrelevant details if you were going to adjust it <laughs> I would say you should adjust it down to match the actual seat cushion because that has a lighter strip horizontally. Mm -hmm. And so if you were going to, if you made those two match, then I think that would probably be slightly nicer. Yeah, you're gotcha. talking about you're talking about right down yeah, here. Absolutely. See that yeah, that has yeah. a little bit of a, a line of, of light there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. Get to work on it, Oren. <laughs> By the time it's in the book. <laughs> so this, this is another one where what ross immediately looked at was the detail of the whistle rope wrapped around his hand it's um it's just the way that he grabs this whistle rope so i captured something here that is specific to him. The, the, the photograph may have that timeless quality, but it is still very specific to this particular engineer. Right. And you know that because of your long-term friendship. That's, I right. think that's, yeah, I think that's great. Well, I, I know it because Ross pointed it out. <laughs> See, again, he, he sees these photographs in some ways much better than I do. Yeah. I, I feel them, Ross really sees them. Yeah. So, so what do you see in this one, Ross, other than your hand wrapped around the uh, whistle rope? And what? Well, that, that, is, that is what the picture is of. Um, and um, 
All right, also timed it. So if you notice, there's the uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania boxcar on mm -hmm. the adjacent track. Um, I'm assuming that that was purposefully done. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> um, but also from, from the getting the engine ready perspective, what I see is I've almost worked myself out of a job on a hot August morning and I get to go home. Uh, because because what I'm doing now is coming up to the crossing. I'm going to spot the engine. I'm going to wipe it down, do whatever else needs done. And then I'm going to hand it off to the crew and it's their engine for the day. Um, so this picture is, yeah, it's almost time to go home. And now we're no longer in August, I take it. No, not so much. <laughs> Now this was this was a magical day that started out just gray and then it started to snow and it snowed all day long and nothing makes me happier. <laughs> well you, so you, this was... you did a wonderful job of capturing uh, you, you know you really nailed the shutter speed to get that uh, to get the streaks in the snow there just right I think. And that's where having a digital camera where I can look at the back and see what I've done right away is hugely <laughs> helpful. Yeah, I can see what would be. Yeah. But I also need to give credit here, in addition to Ross, all the other railroaders at Strasburg who know who I am and um, I, I would say I've been at least marginally generous with, but who trust me. And so both of these photographs were made from Santa's caboose. These are on, it's on a Santa train. And I had the opportunity to ride that caboose all day long, hang out with Santa and mm -hmm. get a photograph from a vantage point that otherwise, at least that day would not have been possible. So I am grateful to them for that. Well, these are these are really uh, evocative photo photos, I think. Um, the the one on the left, when Ross first looked at that, he said, "Oh, it's too bad about the wrinkle in the jacket." And you can see on the the right hand side of that photograph on the eighty nines boiler jacket, it's not quite perfect. Uh huh. And again, one of those details that hadn't made any impression on me until Ross pointed it out. Right. right. So what's your take on, on these photos, Ross? So the one on the left, um, actually, when I first saw it, I did notice that the banding on the jacketing was bent. That's true. Um, I actually thought it was at a different place on the railroad than it is um, just by looking at the crossing. So I'm we're just leaving. Uh, just starting from a stop at Carpenter's for the ghost whistle, um, which is why my hand's on the throttle. And I'm kind of braced against my right arm because I'm using the throttle a little bit to get started. Um, and I think this is, was the first picture of me sanding the engine, was that this morning or was that on another day? I'm honestly not certain. I, I wasn't sure either. Um, but regardless, um, and then in the picture on the right, um, we are drifting into the siding at Groff's Grove um, to let train one head back um, and then we'll continue on our way. Um, so right there, I would be going, I don't know, less than 10 miles an hour, um, just drifting into the siding. And then as soon as we clear, um, they'll storm on out of there. And at the time we were still running um, an hour schedule. So we ran an hour and a half hour. Um, you had to give a full 45 minute trip um, so that Santa could work all his magic. Um, but you also had to hit your meets um, as much as possible exactly on time. Um, so it was a fairly, I wouldn't say hectic, um, but you, you, had to, you had to be on your game all day long mm -hmm. um, to be where you had to be when you needed to be there. Um, and it was just snowing all day. Um, and my recollection of that day was just, it was just a great day on the railroad. Um, everything went well, everybody did their job well. Um, and it was winter railroading without it being brutally cold. So that was nice. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, at the end of the day, I was pretty tired, um, but it had been a great day on the railroad. Yeah, yeah, these, it's wonderful conditions. The snow is just really, uh, 
really adds so much to this. And there's just getting to be enough snow on the ground where, and the snow falling, it, it muffles the sound of the engine. Um, so even in the cab, it, it's, it's a little bit quieter. Um, and that's really nice. Yeah. And this picture is also coming into Groff's Grove. Um, I'm not right, sure. Isn't it's it? exactly the same, exactly the same view from trackside instead of yeah. from the caboose. Right. Well, I think this is my favorite picture uh, from this set of pictures. And I'd like to talk about it just for a minute because I think there's some really outstanding compositional elements here that are worth thinking about. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, the atmosphere is just wonderful with the streaking snow and, and, and Ross looking out the cab window. Um, I, I think that works so well. Uh, and I also like the way that, that this, the um, locomotive is shrouded in steam starting right under the, uh, right under the cab there. Um, and you've got steam that rolls all the way around and then merges with the, with the sky, but the, the, the uh, locomotive is framed by that in a really nice way. And the other thing that I really like about it is the, the, the Strasbourg uh, Railroad logo on the tender is just sticking into the photograph from this side. And, and it's, it, it sort of points across, across the photo and it's balanced by this element here. And I don't even know what that is. I don't know if, if that's a flat car or uh, some kind that's of the platform. Caboose. That's the, 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 uh, that's the, end, the end of the caboose. And the, uh, those are the hand, hand holes of the ladder that goes up to the roof. OK, all right. The, the, so, the two upside down U's. OK, but you know, I don't really need to know what that is, but it, it serves an ex a very important part in this uh, photograph, not only to balance the uh, sign over here, but you know, if you think about it, if you take that out, you know, if you imagine that not being there, or if you cover it up somehow, it really changes this whole photograph um, and gives it more of a, of a uh, ghost riders in the sky kind of thing. It, it makes the, the locomotive almost looks like it's getting ready to take off into the air there. But that really, I think, grounds the photo. And it, it, you know, it also serves the function of stopping your eye from just going on off the edge of the frame there. And it, it, it really just says, we're, we're in this place. You know, we're on the ground. We're in this place. I just think that's a really important element of the photographs. So, so overall, I mean, I think this everything works here just just splendidly, right? Right from the very bottom of the photo. There's just so much to look at here, and um, I, I think this is really an outstanding photograph. Or, and you know, I I'm just really impressed with this. I really appreciate hearing that. Um, I think what you're talking about is what that experience is like being there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All of, that, all of that together is what is what we see as that train goes by. Right, right. And, and again, to go back to something we'd said before, you may not necessarily have been thinking about all of those compositional elements at the time you snapped the shutter, but it, your, your experience and your years as a photographer makes it so that you can see this. You know, you may not be aware of what you're seeing at the time, but I think you, you put together a composition here that's just, you know, it couldn't be any, any cleaner or nicer um, if you had to sit around and thinking about it for, you know, for 20 minutes. So, so I just think this is really outstanding. The last, the last uh, photographs we have here, Oren, are from your three of a kind entry uh, for the John E. Gruber Creative Photography Awards at the Center of Photography, uh, Center of Railroad Photography and Art. Um, and these, of course, are the same, uh, very much the same thing that we've been looking at in that Ross is the subject here and Ross is doing his, doing his work. Um, so talk, talk to us about this, not only about the, the photographs individually, but what made you bring these three photographs together? And I might mention that the theme of, the, of this uh, uh, contest, if you will, was um, three images that, that went together and told a story. And um, so, so I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that, um, Oren. Well, from the, from the time that I first read the call for entries with three of a kind, I knew that I, and we could do two entries, so two sets of three. 
but I knew that both of mine would have people in them. They would be, they would be people pictures. Uh, that, that's the aspect of railroading that I, I feel the, the, I feel the most, um, to me, in my photographs, it's what I consider the most important. There are obviously tremendous opportunities to take photographs of trains, but I like photographing the people who keep those trains running. When I put together, I put together two sets of three, one with engineers and one with hostling. I actually put together many more than two sets because I had a whole bunch of pictures that I really liked. And then the question was to try to put two groups of three together that would impress the judges. Ross was one of my uh, pre-judges and I sent, I don't know, 10, 12 sets. Sometimes it would be two of these with one different. Uh, I went back and forth for, um, oh, I don't know, a month or so trying to come up with the, uh, what I would consider the, the best. When I ended up with these three, what did it for me, the one on the left, looking up into the tender as Ross is trimming the coal pile. I like that one because it's a relatively rare view. Mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of pictures looking in that direction from the footplate of a locomotive. And the way Ross is silhouetted against the sky there, that just struck me as a really strong photograph. I liked it. The one on the far right, this was um, also that hostling morning. This is very first thing in the morning. Ross has come into the engine house. It's the same light that we were talking about at the beginning, the light coming into the engine house through those big windows. That's lighting Ross in the cab of the 90. He's looking into the firebox to check what it looks like. There, there's almost no fire there. There's a bank, a hot bank, but there's very little fire. So we're not getting any light from the firebox on Ross as well. I don't think Ross likes this photograph nearly as much as I do, but something about it, about that arm and the, the human form there, it just moves me. I can't, I can't say why, but th there's, there's that strength, that hand, that arm, and looking into that locomotive, to me, it speaks of, again, the relationship of the man and the machine. The center photograph, I came to like, again, much more after Ross looked at it the first time. And what he immediately saw was where his foot is in that gravel. It's dug in. So you can tell that he, is, he has to brace himself and push against the earth to get that work done as he's opening and closing the, the um, door at the bottom of the ash pan. And that struck me. He, he spoke of that. And it changed the whole way I looked at that photograph. It really told the story of that action. Right. What, what would you say about these, Ross? Um, well, I'll start on the far right. So, so that one's grown on me, thanks to your input. Um, I believe there, there's three little heads over it, but I believe that's in 475. Um, and I like the, the smoke that's wafting up out of it. Um, it also speaks to there, there's something happening here. Um, so as the hostler, I'm looking in and seeing it, but as the viewer of the picture, we're also able to fairly quickly surmise what's happening. Um, so it, there is a context there. Um, the middle one, yes, I, I do like not only how my boot, the heel of my shoe is, is sunk into the ash, um, that rod that I'm holding is what I use to shake the grates or the I'm sorry to to shake the doors on the ash pan um, to break all the ash out of it. Um, I also like how the pant leg is sort of drooping down which is actually exaggerating the man versus machine element of the picture. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously not deliberately just that's what it's doing. Um, and the one on the left I like how you, you actually kind of have to pause and study what's machine, what's fuel, and what's man. Um, it, it's somewhat blurred, so you can catch glimpses through the coal boards. Um, but even then, once you're above the coal boards, 
Um, part of me is still fairly blended in with the coal pile. It's only when I get up against the skyline that it's very distinct um, where I start and stop. And so there's a lot about that that captures what I one of the things that I love about steam locomotives, um, that interplay of man and machine and, and how sometimes the line seems a little blur, blurred. Um, and, and that's a good thing. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it strikes me that, that your arm in that photograph, the way it's raised up there, um, sort of uh, re is reflective <clears throat> or, or conveys sort of the same idea of kinetic energy that the foot dug mm -hmm. into the ash does. You know, we, we both get a sense of strength and they both give us a sense of strength and movement mm -hmm. and effort. Yeah, we'll call these three the Ross's Arms series. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this, has been wonder, this has been wonderful. Um, I, I really appreciate both of you, um, your input into this and your insight into these photographs. I think you all have done a wonderful job, or these are terrific photographs. Um, and, and Ross, it's been a pleasure to not only to meet you and talk to you, but to see you doing what you do. Thank you very much and good night. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ed.